speaker today in this session is Myron A. Penner from Trinity Western University Philosophy. Uh, his title is Lived Faith and Cognitive Intuitions, Some Theological Implications of Cognitive Science of Religion. Why don't we start by you giving yourselves a hand for sticking it out for the Sunday afternoon uh, last session. So yeah, <laughs> you're all to be commended. Uh, I wanna start with a few acknowledgements. Uh, this uh, research was funded by some grants awarded through the Templeton Religion Trust and also the John Templeton Foundation. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, uh, you see uh, a picture of a book, the Oxford Handbook of the Cognitive Science of Religion. Uh, and what I'm gonna present to you today uh, is largely from a co-authored chapter that I have uh, in that book with a cognitive psychologist, uh, Dr. Laird Edmond from Northwestern College uh, in Iowa. Uh, and Laird and I uh, wrote this uh, chapter together and Laird unfortunately couldn't be here today. So uh, the presentation uh, is falling to me. So the, uh, what we're going to do today is I'm going to talk a little bit about cognitive science of religion, uh, this multidisciplinary approach to understanding and explaining religion, uh, and uh, taking a look at some of the scientific approaches to studying religion and drawing some applications for theology. So I'm going to talk a little bit about CSR, cognitive science of religion, then talk a little bit about integrating theology with other disciplines, uh, and then the two main kind of areas within CSR that we're going to look at to apply to theology have to do with uh, what's known as teleological reasoning, uh, and also some of the work coming from CSR uh, on ritual. All right, so just kind of a, an overview introduction to, uh, to CSR. CSR comes out of this branch of psychology known as cognitive psychology. Uh, and what cognitive psychologists foc focus on as a discipline uh, is mapping recurrent species level cognitive processes. These are things that, cognitive processes that we have simply in virtue of being part of the species that we are. Things like memory, perception, uh, attention, language, concept formation, uh, reasoning processes. These are things that cognitive psychologists will try and understand, study, and figure out how they work. And of course, this is an outgrowth of what's known as the cognitive revolution that came uh, in the 1950s, largely as a response to the behaviorism of B.F. Skinner. Uh, and the insight of the cognitive uh, psychologists that constituted the, this, you know, uh, a main push in the cognitive revolution is the idea that the mind uh, is not a blank slate, like many had thought before, uh, but rather the mind has within it these propensities to structure uh, experience in certain ways. Uh, and so that is something that we'll uh, unpack a little bit as we go. Well, uh, it turns out, you might think that religion uh, itself is a species level phenomenon, right? And if that's the case, if it is really the case that wherever you've had homo sapiens, you've had beliefs and practices and behaviors that could be deemed to be religious, uh, then you might think that the religious life is also suitable for study uh, at, the level, at the species level of cognition. And so uh, in the 80s and into the 90s, you had a, a multidisciplinary research uh, trajectory that was uh, uh, undertaken by anthropologists and religion scholars and some philosophers were involved in this project using kind of the resources of cognitive psychology to explain recurring features of religion in, in the populations that they were studying. And they were able to draw in experimental and cognitive and social psychologists. Uh, and what we have now, uh, several decades after this initial research trajectory was started, uh, is a robust field of study uh, known as cognitive science uh, of religion. So the basic framework of CSR, again, is this idea that the mind is not a blank slate, but rather the mind uh, uh, can be thought of as an assemblage uh, of mental tools. And again, mental tools that we have in virtue of having brain structured the way that they are, are these uh, innate propensities that we have to structure experience in certain ways, uh, which are tuned by culture, but it's important to note that they are not generated by culture. And these mental tools, uh, constrain and inform the thoughts that we have, right? They can, they, uh, you know, structure our experience in ways that make it very easy to believe some things and make it very difficult to believe others. Now within CSR, you might've heard this, pro this uh, uh, concept before of dual processing cognition, uh, the idea that uh, it makes sense in some ways to talk about our co some cognitive processes as being very quick and fast and automatic, and it makes sense to, to talk about another subset of uh, cognition processes that we have as being more slower uh, and effortful and uh, more reflective. And sometimes these go by the name of system one to talk about these quick automatic processes and system two as 
kind of a catch-all umbrella term for these other sorts uh, of, of reflective processes. And it turns out that the cognitive processes that are most salient for the religious life are often found uh, in system one, these automatic intuitive belief forming processes that we have uh, as human beings. And so when it comes to cognitive science of religion and the task of explaining religious beliefs and practices and behaviors, uh, explaining religion uh, for the, the, the cognitive scientist of religion is a matter of showing how our recurrent mental uh, tools and recurrent environmental factors resist or encourage uh, the spread of ideas and beliefs and practices that can be deemed uh, religious, right? And so this idea that we have uh, uh, kind of innate propensities to believe certain things, structure experience in certain ways that, give, that naturally give rise uh, to religious beliefs, practices, uh, and be behaviors. All right, so one kind of distinction, uh, one kind of way of talking about this dual processing account is to distinguish between their outputs. And so you might think of reflective beliefs as the outputs of these you know, slower, more effortful uh, cognitive processes where you really think hard and long about something and you draw an inference and then you come to a conclusion. Compare that with uh, quick and automatic cognitive processes that generate outputs, uh, not in response to other beliefs, but rather as the direct response to our environment and you might think their outputs as being non-reflective beliefs. So these non-reflective beliefs, typically, you know, one way of talking about it is that they come from system one. They don't arise through reflection or deliberation, and they are the immediate outputs of uh, domain-specific mental tools. And so we're going to give a, a couple of examples here. So on the left here, we've got kind of a list of different types of tools. These are different ways of talking about cognitive processes that are, are, are widely recurrent, and then these would be the outputs. So you might think that we have this cognitive uh, uh, process that is geared towards quick and automatic beliefs about physical objects. Called, sometimes it's called naive physics. And this is the idea that unsupported objects fall. It's not the kind of thing you have to teach someone when they see a, a cup kind of falling off the edge of the table. There's just this immediate output. Well, it's not supported, it's gonna fall. Similarly, this domain of, of beliefs about living things, sometimes called naive biology. And it's just very quick and intuitive to think that raccoons and possums are, are quite similar. Now, importantly here, this one on agency detection, this is uh, particularly relevant for uh, religious belief and religious life, sometimes called hypersensitive agency detection. There are certain things that we interact with, certain events that we respond to, and it is immediately apparent to us, or it seems immediately apparent to us that some agent is responsible for that, right? If you're walking along and you hear kind of a knocking, you don't have to consider an argument or lots of evidence to, to think that someone is knocking, right? It's just, oh, there is someone, some agent behind that event. And the, the last one here, theory of mind, is just this automatic propensity we have to see certain things as reflecting mental states. I see a furrowed brow, I see a smile. I immediately am assuming that there is some kind of, of mental state that is responsible for what it is that we're seeing. Right, so these are quick automatic uh, outputs of these uh, cognitive processes that we have. Well, uh, what's often um, one, one way of describing kind of the, the standard kind of description of cognitive science of religion, this comes from philosopher Michael Murray, it's now known as the standard model, uh, supernatural agent beliefs, right? If we talk about that aspect of many religions, which involves believing in supernatural agents, the, the CSR response to that is to say, well, supernatural agent beliefs arise and persist because they're just the natural outputs of innate cognitive mechanisms or propensities that we have, especially agency detection and theory of mind. Uh, they're counterintuitive in ways that make them stick, easy to transmit. Uh, they're beneficial to us. They provide uh, 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 assistance in performing stable uh, and um, beneficial group relationships. And they also are inference rich. Earlier talk this, in this session talked about narrative and storytelling. And what uh, religious concepts do is they do provide a, a, a wide framework that allows us to explain things in the world that we see. Now, I haven't mentioned evolutionary psychology so far, but if you connect cognitive science of religion with evolutionary psychology, you get a really powerful explanatory framework. Uh, cognitive science will ask, well, what is the nature and function of our mental tools? Evolutionary psychology is going to ask, well, why did we evolve with this particular arrangement of tools? 
And together, they can really give us a description of the religious life purely in naturalistic terms. CSR will tell us what tools are operative in forming religious beliefs. Evolutionary psychology will tell us why these tools were selected for. And most cognitive scientists of religion, when it comes to the mental tools that are respo responsible for religious life, will think that they were not selected for the purpose of developing belief in supernatural agents. They were developed for other purposes. But what happens when you put these tools in the same toolkit, it makes religion very natural. And so in this sense, they would see religion as a, a a cognitive spandrel or a byproduct of the mental tools that were selected for other purposes. So you might ask, well, why do people have religious belief? And on CSR, the standard answer is that because our minds have evolved in ways that incline them to form uh, and sustain religious beliefs, practices, and behaviors, cognitively, religion uh, is very natural. Well, you might ask yourself, does this mean that we have evidence against religious belief? Some have argued that CSR actually provides evidence for religious belief. I actually think that cognitive science doesn't give us evidence for or against religious belief, uh, and I've argued for that in this uh, reference here from 2018 in Faith and Philosophy. Okay, well, that's kind of a whirlwind over to, over, uh, overview of cognitive science of religion. I want to talk a little bit now about the, the, the theologian's task and the way the theologian uh, can uh, integrate data from other disciplines. So theology as a discipline uh, is very um, uh, integrative and incorporates data from a wide set of resources into a coherent story and a coherent and unified story of who God is and how all things relate to God. And of course, Christian theology is going to put Jesus at the beginning, middle, uh, and end of that story. Well, when it comes to scientific approaches to studying religion, uh, both my collaborator and I and many others believe that uh, the scientific approach to studying religion can actually inform theological stories that are told by a particular religion. You see, in a sense, theology tells a story about what the religious life of people is like. And cognitive science of religion also tells a story about what the religious life of people is like. And it can be very informative and productive to take the story that is told to us by cognitive science of religion, evidence-based, empirically supported, generating testable hypotheses. I mean, it's social science, not physics, so we have to hold these results a little bit more loosely. But, uh, but at the same time, they are presenting a very um, robust story about many, many aspects of the religious life. And so you might think that it could be productive to see how CSR can connect to a theological narrative. So what we argue in our chapter is that cognitive science of religion can actually, in some cases, provide a corrective to mistaken or perhaps misleading theologies. And we think also that using CSR can generate a new conceptual space for theological reflection. So one of these areas uh, that we want to focus on is teleological reasoning. Many of you will know that the word telos is a Greek word that means goal or end uh, or purpose. And so teleological reasoning is drawing an inference that appeals to purposes, purpose of action, as causal or explanatory. And there's a lot of research in uh, the CSR world on teleological reasoning. Uh, this uh, term called promiscuous teleology comes to us from Deb Kellerman, and it's turns out that attributing intended purposes behind wide categories of events seems to be an intuitive part uh, of human co cognition. Lots of research to demonstrate and show this. Uh, it appears very early on uh, in lifespan. There's uh, a very uh, you know, well-cited study in which uh, uh, researchers are interviewing children and putting them out through all sorts of different interesting tasks and reflecting on them. And so one, you know, quote that's often referenced is, well, why, you know, p children are asked, well, why are rocks pointy? And they immediately default to a purpose of explanation. Well, rocks are pointy so that the animals don't sit on them, right? That's an example of teleological reasoning. But not only does this type of reasoning uh, appear early in lifespan, it persists across lifespan. And it persists among the religious, and it persists among the non-religious. And so there's also interesting research to show that uh, highly committed non-religious people and atheists, when you put them under cognitive load, have them underperform some kind of distractor task, uh, and then 
present to them questions about explanation, their intuitive default is to appeal to purposive explanations, right? And so we can't really help but explain many things or default to teleological reasoning. This is an interesting feature of human psychology. But what we think it has implications for is uh, many, or it has applications for many theological contexts. You see, it is theologically natural for Christians to ask and answer, what is the purpose behind events? What is God's purpose? What is God's purpose for me? What is God's purpose for allowing something to happen? But we also wanna point out that not only is it theologically natural for Christians to ask, what is the purpose? It is cognitively natural for homo sapiens to ask and answer, what is the purpose behind events? And so we just wanna point out that there is a, a cautionary note that, that uh, needs to be applied in theologically salient contexts. You see, in many contexts, our cognitive intuitions are gonna pump out purpose of explanations. They're gonna do that quickly, they're gonna do that easily because it's part of how we are, our, our, uh, our cognition has evolved. We find it very cognitively satisfying to spit out purpose, uh, purpose of explanations. And so when Christians attribute divine purpose to some event, right? This is the salient question that we need to ask. You know, is it because we have correctly identified and discerned God's purpose for this particular event? Or is this merely an instance of promiscuous teleology running wild, right? Uh, and so when we have this feature of the religious life and the theological life, uh, and we see purposes that are appealed to, this is something of a cautionary note that we, that we wanna say. But we think also that there is a generative application here that can be understood for, uh, for congregational life, for church life, for Christian community. We are not saying that we should abandon the search for divine purposes, but rather, you know, given the propensity for teleological reasoning, we think that CSR suggests that, that we need a sustained commitment to seek out and engage multiple narratives about what, what God's purposes might be so that we can discern collectively together. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about ritual uh, and worship. Uh, lots of the, the, the lots and lots of research on ritual, uh, very interesting, fascinating studies, different models and theories within CSR about how rituals function, how, what they do. Uh, but there seems to be consensus on a number of different things, namely that rituals uh, are, are very useful and important for promoting social cohesion. Uh, rituals, collective activities that are shared together and structured in certain ways uh, can develop uh, and strengthen in-group bonds. Uh, they increase pro-sociality among uh, in-group, the opening plenary section uh, session that we had for this conference. Uh, the speaker talked about the wave, you know, and there's kind of a collective effervescence that happens when you're in a big stadium together and you're all doing the wave shared activity. You kind of feel bonded to the people that are next to you. May act, may, it may cause you to act more kindly towards them, uh, increase pro-sociality among in-group. Rituals also provide a sense of shared identity. It's also interesting research to show that ritualized behavior increases, has a, a, a pedagogical function, uh, enhances memory. Children who are put through different tasks uh, that are highly ritualized uh, seem to perform better on functions when they're put, given the same task with, uh, without the anchor of ritual, ritualized behavior and instructions. Well, uh, rituals uh, are very good at helping you know who's on your team, right? You have a ritual handshake, if someone doesn't pass the handshake, uh, they, you know that they're not part of that, that uh, described in-group. And we think that this actually provides a, a note of caution for, uh, for Christians. Because increased in-group in bonds, increased bonds, that's a whole nother thing. I feel like that would be a topic of, of something else. Increased in-group bonds uh, and social cohesion tends to correlate with out-group derogation and rejection. Basically what that means is that, you know, if you have a, a highly bonded uh, in-group uh, enhanced through ritual behavior and ritual practices, it tends to also correlate with negative views uh, towards the out-group, right? Religion can be very good at helping you identify who's on your team and the rituals that support that, but it tends to correlate with uh, rejecting, othering people, uh, and out-group derogation. And so this is a challenge. This is a challenge for, uh, for what you might think of as out-group hospitality, right? How do our rituals reinforce lines between who's in 
uh, and who's out, right? And, 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 you know, there are all sorts of formal and informal rituals that, that uh, communities engage in, and they have consequences for forming bonds within the group, but also forming uh, beliefs and behaviors that reject those that are out of the group. So we think that there is a, a corrective here that, uh, that also can be applied to between the form of the ritual and the function of it. There's a note here about Lawson and Macaulay, and I should say too that you know, we're skipping over lots of information here. If you do have uh, interest in more of this, the chapter that we've talked about has an extensive reference list. But what Lawson and Macaulay point out in their analysis of ritual is that it's, it makes sense to analyze ritual in terms of broader patterns of social engagement, particularly those in which there are agents and recipients, uh, exchange mechanisms that happen in different types of, of social arrangements. And one of the things that they note is that if you have a ritual that has high sensory pageantry, lots of things going on, lots of affect, lots of smells and bells, uh, those rituals are most effective if they are done infrequently and they are correlated with what they term special agent rituals, right? Something where God is doing something or the God is involved in doing something that doesn't happen on an everyday kind of basis. And it makes sense, you might think just, just uh, conceptually, but it also makes sense cognitively that if you have high sensory pageantry, this should be reserved for special agent rituals. Otherwise, you get kind of a deadening impact uh, and uh, sensory overload. And so we think the application here when it comes to thinking through the, the cognition of ritual is that when in designing and evaluating rituals, we need to ask, is the ritual form, right, the actual structure of the practice that you're engaged in as a community, and the function of that ritual, what it's trying to say and what it's trying to do, are, there co are they cognitively congruent? You might also want to pay attention to whether or not these rituals are sufficiently participatory to strengthen group bonds. And you might also wonder whether they enhance the in-group uh, at the expense of the out-group, right? So these are just uh, a few salient things in, uh, that uh, uh, cognitive science the study of ritual can be applied to the, uh, the theological life of Christian community. So I'm happy to take any questions that you have uh, and uh, look forward to our chat together. So could you give us an example of a ritual and how you would apply that to the ritual? Well, um, yeah, so uh, my colleague Laird has thought a lot about this, and so what I'm going to tell you is going to uh, reflect some of the stuff that he, he has said uh, based on his own kind of analysis. Um, he would say that uh, when it comes to, for example, weekly Sunday service, uh, Sunday worship services, worship services that happen on a, on a you know, weekly basis, uh, if, they, if they have too much sensory pageantry, uh, they will be hard to sustain over time. Uh, inter and not, not hard to sustain in the sense that they can't be done. I mean, if you have a, uh, an infrastructure in place, you can, you can put the show on every week. But in terms of the life of the community, there's going to be a deadening impact cognitively. That would be one example. Uh, another example would be uh, if you have a, a very special uh, event theologically, something like a, like a, a, a baptism uh, or, um, you know, something that is, that is really... Uh, you know, depending on your theological frameworks, you know, it's going to happen at a very pivotal moment in the life of the individual, in the life of the family, uh, a once, a once, once for all kind of thing. Uh, that needs to have some special, you know, there, it, it is, it is uh, perfectly fine to envelop that in something that is significant, unique. Uh, it doesn't look like other things that we do because that uh, is going to, going to communicate a different point. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Pinner. That was exceptionally clear and amazing summary. Um, my Thanks for your comment. Next. <laughs> um, yeah, my question is, it's something that I've wrestled with, lo uh, the logic of promiscuous teleology, which is it's usually given, why do we have promiscuous teleology? It's usually given a functional explanation. It is for the sake of, you know, survival and reproduction, you know, in, in that way it promotes, you know, like it has as a certain function within this natural selection scheme. Um, but that itself is a teleological explanation. And I always thought, is, te is promiscuous teleo or 
teleology itself a victim of promiscuous teleology? Are we over ascribing? <laughs> yeah, it, the, there seems to be a logical conundrum of giving a, a functional explanation um, while at the same time saying it's promiscuous. Yeah, so there might be, uh, um, you know, is, is, there, is there a kind of circularity there? You might, you might wonder, giving, you know, asking what the purpose is of the cognitive propensity we have to attribute purpose to things. Self-defeatingness. Well, I, I mean, not all types of circularity are, are, are going to be self-defeating. Some, some types of circularity uh, are, are going to be of the sort where you just can't, can't escape it. Like if, and a common example that's given in uh, epistemology is, um, you know, this, the, the, the branch of philosophy that asks how it is that we come to know things. I mean, how could you come to know that your sense perception is reliable? Well, typically we appeal to, you know, well, I... I see you, and I see you, and you know I I can hear and and you know gain data through through sensory inputs. Well, you can't take the reliability of that without assuming that it is reliable. And so you either have to say, well, there's no way to rationally believe that our sense perception is reliable, or you might just think that some kinds of circularity are not going to be defeating from a, a justification standpoint. So you might think, well, okay, maybe there's no way to get out of the circle of when it comes to asking for purposes. You know, how do we explain the purpose of this capacity we or this propensity we have to seek out and give purposes? It just might be the way it goes. Yes, up here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is this. Um, in terms of CSR, the cognitive architecture that we have that is structured innately in certain ways so that we behave in certain ways, have certain reflexes and so on. I'm wondering if this is intrinsic to the structure or if this is imposed. Um, so is it something that is pre-structured or is it something that we structure? And, and then we might mistake it for being pre-structured. I'm not sure how that line is, uh, is overcome. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, if I understand the question correctly, I think that's probably going to be, going to be you know, asked of all kind of psychological science. You know, as uh, you know, psychological science in, in its different facets seeks to understand uh, the mental lives of human beings as individuals and groups, as uh, species, there's going to be a question of, you know, are the data that are drawn from psych uh, structured because we've correctly mapped the architecture of the human mind, or are the outputs that we're getting from the data a function of the structure that we're imposing on, on the data? And that's you know, uh, a, a particular worry or an issue that psychology has to deal with uh, in, in incremental ways. Uh, so, and, and I think you know, there, are, there are ways to, to address that. Uh, there, it's, it's, it's more challenging. So there, there's a phenomenon in psychology called the replication crisis, uh, which means that you know, some, some significant results in psychology have not been able to be replicated. And so I would, like to, I would tease my colleague Laird about this, right? I said, you know, and, and he would just say, well, look, people are more complicated than electrons, right? There's not a replication crisis in physics because people are more complicated than electrons. I and mean, then there's a, there's a sense in which he's right. So thanks for the question. Yes. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you for, for the talk. It's the first time I heard about this. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm trying to um, understand it better. Um, it, I'm not sure quite how to phrase this or how to word it, but um, it kind of seems you might call this promiscuous um, <laughs> teleological type of question, but um, it, you know, the, the way we normally um, do science to describe natural events and stuff, we assume that there are natural causes for everything. Yeah. And then we do experiments and verification, all that stuff, and yeah. assume that the supernatural is not involved. Right. Um, in a normal process. Right. Um, but, but we as Christians, we believe that God created us with a um, propensity to um, learn to know God and to experience God on some level, in image of God or whatever you want to call it. And uh, perhaps this psychological uh, part of our minds was created by God to facilitate that, to learn to know God. And, and if that is true, then this ability, this propensity we have is, is more than just a survival technique that evolutionaries, uh, that, that, um, that um, 
evolutionary biology might propose, um, but I don't really know a whole lot about evolutionary uh, biological um, th that way. But but I'm wondering if you could comment on how do you, um, uh, <laughs> you there's some um, assumptions you have to make ahead of time with um, what you can include or disclude as purpose or, or causing why, why this happens. Uh, yeah, so I'll, maybe I'll just respond uh, with a personal story. So the, um, I got interested in, in cognitive science of religion uh, because it's, you know, it seemed like, you know, as, as some fairly robust models were coming out of CSR that, uh, uh, you know, were explaining all sorts of aspects of the religious life in ways that seem to be experimentally supported and fitting with other, other, other you know, data from other, other sciences. Um, and it just seemed to be assumed by many of the, the researchers that you know, this has explained away uh, religious belief. And in fact, uh, Richard Dawkins uh, in The God Delusion quotes uh, CSR research. Um, one of the, the early pioneers in this, in this field is a man by the name of Justin Barrett. Uh, Barrett is very strong in the, uh, um, you know, the, the, the cognitive naturalness of religious belief. And Dawkins uh, has, you know, quotes Barrett's research as just kind of evidence that we have now given it a sufficient explanation for religion. We've now explained religion away. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is Justin Barrett is a very, uh, you know, mainstream evangelical Christian. I went to Calvin University uh, College back then as an undergrad. Uh, and, you know, uh, he doesn't, Justin Barrett doesn't think his research explains God away. Uh, he just feels that, you know, what they've done through CSR, through these variety of experimental methods, is given insight into the cognitive processes that underwrite and sustain uh, religious belief, right? And so, um, you know, so, so that, uh, you know, so, so your question about methodological naturalism, right, like, when it comes to science and doing scientific research and scientific uh, approaches to, uh, to you know, explain and understand causes and mechanisms and a particular phenomenon, uh, you know, setting aside, we don't look for supernatural causes, right? And I think there's an analogy here to uh, theistic evolutionists who would say that, you know, who would, who would look at evolutionary science as bringing uh, a level of explanation to certain natural phenomena, but, seeing, but, but not seeing that in any way detracting from God's agency or, or God's creative act or God's working in the world. And um, so I think that there's a, a good parallel there. Uh, yeah, so, so, yeah, so, so, so some have, some have argued. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so you might think that if God is concerned about having uh, creatures who bear, you know, God's image, in you know, that they would be endowed with you know cognitive propensities to form belief about the supernatural, right? So I think you know that's that's a way that that some some have gone for sure. Okay, I, I know that there was a few more questions, but it's after five, so we're gonna stop, but you can come and bug Dr. Pinner a little more. So let's thank uh, Dr. Pinner and all our speakers this thank session. Thank you.